I am sorry. As those words meet your ears, you sit somewhere at the crossroads of losing yourself to trying to make sense of it all in a hurry. With cupped hands, you try to hold the hails from falling from the sky, only to realize that you are being showered by dust of your own crumbling world that was built from matchsticks, spiraling to the ground faster than you can hold. You find yourself gripping the air like you're holding on to an invisible rope, blinded by the choking smoke, but it's not the smoke that chokes you. It's the memories that you had with her, and you unravel into an emotional whirlpool. Each memory of hers rises in a bubble and floats around your head, and you want to move ahead, but there are way too many bubbles in front of you, and you cannot look at the path ahead, like your first day at school when her fingers reach so perfectly with yours, assuring you that you will find a second home here. Like the time when you could barely color within the lines, and yet she held up your first superhero drawing for everybody to see with pride. Even when your superhero was wearing nothing but red underwear, and you ran to her tugging at a dress, asking her to take it down before your friends could see. Like the time you felt the first flutter of butterflies in your stomach, having met a boy you fancied, and Mama looked at you as if to say, I know what you're up to. This was your kingdom. A kingdom whose skyline was many first, and you never thought that this moment today would be your last. And with sorrow that weighs on your shoulders like weight of a thousand years, you try to push the bubbles aside just so you can move forward with no fear. And yet you find yourself walking around the bubbles just so you don't burst them and lose her memories in the rubble. The path that you walk on is paved with denial. It is riddled by rocks of anger. And it is filled with puddles of depression. And an earnest prayer rises from your chest to the heavens above, why? Why could it not have been me instead? What her doctor did not tell you was that your grief will go beyond the five stages. What her doctor did not tell you was how you could bring life to her last few months. What her doctor did not tell you was how you could be the daughter you wanted to be and really move forward even when she's gone and that death is hardest on the living. And yet you remember with a smile that all that mama asked for you to do was to keep believing that the best is ahead of you. And so you tell yourself that I will be okay even when a part of your world has left the world. I am a survivor. And you know that the only balm to your pain is the feel of her touch lingering on your skin. I am a fighter. And you know that even if it takes time, your head will surface above the water for a breath of air called new life and that you will move forward. All that mama wanted you to do was believe that tomorrow the sun will rise, your eyes will open, your lungs will expand and take in new air, and your feet will place themselves on grass and walk on a landscape, which is a dream that you both built together. You know that your hands will open many doors, and behind those doors, you will find her legacy, and that legacy will always you know that all that mama ever asked of you was for you to believe that no matter what, keep moving forward because she is never truly gone. Her death never stopped for her and she never stopped for death. They just met in the way and her legacy will always live on. With that, your grief finds a healthy release and finally, after long last, you find the courage to move on. Okay, so that was spoken word poetry. It was uh, dedicated to my dead mother who passed away from stage 4 stomach cancer at the age of 49. And I just want us to pause a little bit here. I know that was a very emotional piece. Um, and ask you a question. See, how, how did it make you feel? Did it make you feel emotional? Did it tug at your heart? Some of you may have experienced a loved one who died or someone who's dying right now. Did it resonate with you? A show of hands. Have you felt any of these sentiments? 
Okay, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is why I am standing here in front of you today to tell you that liberal arts, spoken word poetry, drawing, these are the things I use to connect with my patients. Medicine is a very um, dynamic science. Um, on the one hand, you are supposed to be the master of all academic knowledge there is. You're supposed to memorize everything like that and have your pharmacology on the tip of your tongue and be the best you can be, get your perfect grades. But on the other hand, the other color, be it white or black, is that you need to strike that intimacy with your patient. You need to see your patient as a wholesome person and not as a bag of organs, but an organism with a soul. And there's a gray area in between. And this is exactly where liberal arts and medical humanities comes in to strike a marriage between the two. I'm sure many of you have experienced doctors who pretty much treat you as a faceless bed number. They don't know your name. They don't care who you are. They don't care about your personal story. All they want to do is give you that medicine, give you ranitidin, send you back home. And I have personally seen patients who died just because the intern was too arrogant to admit his mistake and actually gave a tablet for gastritis instead of actually acknowledging that this woman was having an active heart attack right in front of his eyes. This is what medical humanities does. This is what liberal arts does. It really makes your patients uh, connect with you and you are able to strike that intimacy and because of that you are able to be a better doctor. Now I'm not just talking about doctors here, I know there are many young people here in this room and I'm really fortunate to be speaking in front of you but there must be some of you who want to become doctors, right? Okay, and also doctors, doctors aside, as a person whose, young, uh, whose loved one is suffering through a terminal condition, you need this as well. You need to take care of yourself too as a caregiver and this is where liberal arts and medical humanities comes in as well. Okay, so I want to go back to the poem and tell you how it began to take shape. It took shape two years ago when I was uh, in the final few phases of my clinical training in St. Lucia in, um, uh, in the Caribbean and I didn't really find any mechanism to cope so I started writing. And it was performed just a few weeks ago actually at the Bangkok Lyrical Lunacy um, and a friend's face comes to my mind right now. His name was Jeff. And Jeff walks up to me and says, Hey, you know what? I have a father who is in the final stages of pancreatic cancer. And I have felt so much agony, so much sadness that I've never been able to even talk about it with anyone. But your poetry made me find a healthy release to my grief, made me come to terms with it. And I was hooked ever since to do this and to actually... Um, pursue this more seriously now. So medical humanities, there's no hard and fast definition per se for it. Uh, it basically involves three components. The first is liberal arts, and I said spoken word is one of them. The other is the use of social sciences. And the third component is the use of humanities itself, which could be subjects like history, philosophy, theology, all of that. So you bring all of them together and you actually give a multi-dimensional healing process to your patients. Having said that, I will break it down to three benefits of using medical humanities or liberal arts uh, as a physician or as a caregiver or uh, as simply being on the other end of the line where you know somebody who is dying or who is sick. The first A would be the ability to cope. An example. I will never forget the face of a patient, uh, my first patient who died. His name was David. David was in the last stages of pancreatic cancer. He was 55 years old and he had three young children. And David was very angry all the time, so much so that he wanted to commit suicide. He didn't see a worth and value in his life anymore. And he was like, okay, if I have to go, I might as well just go now. And then I said to him, you know what, why don't you start writing? Why didn't you start expressing what you feel in your heart on paper? Make love to your paper and put those words on paper. He was quite skeptical in the beginning. Later on he came around and he saw it and he did it. And he did die, but he died a peaceful death, having made uh, his peace with death. And he went, uh, okay. And on his tombstone he had these words engraved. These actually Norman Cousins words that said, the tragedy of life is not death but it is what we choose to let die within ourselves when we live. 
So there you go, it gives you the ability of, uh, to cope. B would be it builds compassion and empathy in you. Now medicine is an empirical science. We thrive on empirical evidence all the time. We want to see tangible statistics and numbers and data in front of us. But medical humanities, you can't really measure that. And I think that is where um, a beautiful thing happens. Because you're not able to measure it, you are able to actually inculcate soft skills in your would-be doctors, young doctors, old doctors, and actually be that advocate for your patients. The third I would say is that it conceptualizes concepts that cannot be taught. Now, I'm sure all of you will agree that there's no hard and fast way to teach compassion anymore. You have to feel it, you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes and be able to see that and then you have compassion going from your heart. So the use of arts, the use of medical humanities helps you do that. Okay, so three benefits. Now what can you do here? Find young people here in the room and very well seasoned veterans here surrounding us as well. What can you do? You don't have to be a doctor to take this forward. You could do three things. You could be an advocate. So when the young rock stars do become, do start the journey to be physicians, advocate for incorporating medical humanities and liberal arts in your medical education. Lobby with your medical school dean, talk to your teachers and tell them that you need this component in your training as a physician. The B would be that you need to be an ambassador yourself. Many of my well-esteemed speakers said it, that it's only you who's preventing yourself from moving forward. So don't do that. Everybody is Maya Angelou. Everybody here is a poet. Everybody here is a writer. Break that shell. Come out of it. Breathe and put those words on paper and start practicing your art. So be an ambassador yourself. The third is the simple idea that you need to believe that as a doctor, you are a considerate person and you are a healer who heals your p patients inside out and not the other way around. They don't come to you to heal from the outside, it's from the inside. So three reasons right here. Okay, so I'm gonna close with another spoken word performance. And uh, since I see many of you showing the enthusiasm and nodding, I think it would be a good way to close my speech. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. The next time you feel too comfortable sleeping on your old pillow, Toss it aside and come join me on a long, meandering road. All I ask is for you to bring three things. A, a mind that absorbs like a sponge, eyes that observe like a hawk, and a heart with plenty of room for acceptance of a world that stretches ahead of us so broad. Our journey will be quite bumpy, bumps of unknown sights, smells, and sounds waiting to be uncovered. And yet you and I, we will keep moving forward towards the horizon that winks at us with a promise waiting to be discovered. During our journey, we will meet many people who and just like how no finger of the same hand is of the same length, with those very fingers, they will point at you and say, hey, you're too tall to be around here. Some will say, why do you say tomatoes and not tomatoes? Some will ask you, do you believe in God? And a lot will say, can you take your headscarf off? During this journey, you will meet many strangers who you will be forced to trust. And that will initially make your stomach churn because you think that you are getting yourself into impending danger. During your journey, you will also experience tastes that never touched your tongue. Your eyes will feast on a kaleidoscope of sights, and your hands will feel touch that never reached your fingertips, and your legs will walk on landscape that they're not familiar with. Twilight is approaching. Your restless young spirit is now kind of getting tired, and you are longing for the comfort of that old familiar pillow and your ears are getting a bit too sore from all the folklore. We've been here for a while, you and I, on this long meandering road, and finally we come to a bend where you start to empty out your backpack and what do you throw out? You throw out tangled tubes of racism, you throw out broken jars of prejudice, you throw out torn pages of discrimination and broken glass of fear, all the while loosening the strings to your heart just so you can make more room for acceptance and feel more near. You finally see that your spirit comes truly alive only when you break the habit of walking so slowly, weighed down by your own expectations. You finally see the beauty that is you because everybody else is taken and there's only one person in the world like you. 
during this journey, you finally realize that diversity is the one that clips you from your attachments, just you can move forward and fly freely without any lament. But most of all, during this journey, you break out of this cage of ego and you resist the seductive advances of a mistress call familiarity and comfort just so you can feel the joy only a wayfarer feels after a long journey when he spots a sliver of light and a smoking chimney in the distance when he emerges from within the woods. And you, when, come, when you come out of the woods, you stumble on this book that is the world and life. And you know that this page that you have turned today is not your first and nor will it be your last. And that you will continue to turn the pages of this book even when your past is cast. But more importantly, it is because you chose to follow the wind that keeps you growing and you have finally found comfort in the idea that home is not a place but a feeling. Thank you.